This is Mariam Lemu. I was asked to give a talk recently on countering violent extremism through love and tolerance. Now, this is not my area of strength. In fact, I remember when I was invited, I told them, you've got the wrong Lemu. My brother Nuru is the expert in this topic, and he patiently, painstakingly helped me understand this very, very complex topic. And then my husband and another good friend, Mustafa Masoud, also gave me more insight in this topic. So I've got to give credit where it's due. And I also have my notes because I've not got all this stuff in my head. So first, I'm not an expert in this topic, neither am I a scholar. I'm actually a student. So with all humility, permit me to share the little I have learned from a layman's perspective. Now, I shall be sharing four things with you. But first, let us recognize the complexity of the topic, love and tolerance. With all the multiple interested voices we have in Nigeria, those interested in keeping us together and those interested in dividing us. And yes, we cannot pretend that we do not know. We have people in our midst who are trying to divide us, camouflaging in the name of religion or anything else. And yes, love and tolerance are very, very important ingredients for peace. However, they are not sufficient. I can forgive you, my enemy, for all you have done and learn to love you. However, if my enemy continues to inflict pain on me, it becomes very hard for me to keep turning the other cheek, forgiving and loving. It's no longer fair for me not to bring justice in. Justice is critical for long-term peace. The rule of law is critical for long-term peace. If you do not care about justice, then your love is fake. And then love has to be guided by knowledge, otherwise it is blind. Some, they are so head over heels in love, they are blind to the flaws of the person they're in love with. So for some people, their love for a particular thing or particular cause is so strong that they no longer see the negative in that particular thing they're in love with. And then tolerance is good but we should have a zero tolerance to certain things like corruption, bigotry, xenophobia, and so on. And it's not good enough to just say, I'm tolerating you or I'm managing you as a Muslim or a Christian or a non-Indigen in Nigeria, but I respect your rights, that you are a full Nigerian just as much as I am. Sadly, many who really care don't seem united with those on the other side who also really care. And then there are those who do not want peace. And it forces you to ask, who thrived during the crisis? Who raised the most funds from this narrative? Otherwise, why is it that they are not interested in peace for their own people and their own country? But that's a discussion for a different day. Having said that, let's look at the unique situation we have here in Nigeria. Currently, we have three major forms of violent extremism. Conflict between herdsmen and arable farmers, between indigens and settlers, and between Boko Haram, violent extremists, and others. And then in between, we've seen a rise in kidnappings, gang violence, and so on. My brother broke it down for me with a metaphor that just made sense. He said, violent extremism are like potholes. They look similar everywhere around the world. They seem very simple from a distance. However, as you get closer, they start to get complicated. So it's easy to conclude that they have the same causes and the same solutions, not true. Potholes, yes, do similar damage to vehicles. And yes, if you leave them, they continue to expand. But you don't conclude that because yours look similar to mine, that they are the same. The causes may be very different and the solutions will most likely be quite different. We cannot conclude that because people are being killed here and there, and people are fleeing for their lives and are being displaced here and there, and places of worship are being raised to the ground here and there, that the causes are the same. The things that may have caused your potholes may be quite different from those that caused mine. Yours may have been caused by the excessive weight of vehicles that are going on it or underlying soil, whereas mine may have been caused by poor quality asphalt, poor workmanship or corruption related issues. And theirs over there may have been caused by excessive heat and in other countries, excessive cold or frost. One thing we do know about potholes, though, is that if you leave them, they continue to expand. They get worse. So you cannot say that you're not going to do anything about violent extremism. Otherwise, it will engulf a society. And due to the complexity of the problem, what we find is that there is a strong need for the leadership to be very careful in its diagnosis. Otherwise, wrong diagnosis will lead to wrong prescription. This creates opportunities for opportunists to come in and exploit which in turn delays the suffering of the victims. So the first point is proper diagnosis for proper prescription.
And that leads me to my second point, that we need to recognize that, yes, we have prejudice, we have hate speech people, we have bigots, we have radicals and fundamentalists and people who are extremists from all sides of the divides. But let us also recognize that while religious scholars have a role to play in countering their own heretics, their own bigots and extremists and the ideologies behind their beliefs, very often we find that ideology alone does not produce a movement. Ideology alone does not produce violent extremism. Ideology needs grievances in order to mobilize people. This brings me to the second metaphor that my brother shared with me, and that is one of a ship. That society is like a ship with the upper deck and the lower deck. And those in the upper deck are the leadership and the elite in society. And those in the lower deck are the common folks and the masses. If the people in the upper deck do not listen to the cries, do not meet the grievances of those in the lower deck and their basic fundamental needs and rights, often what they say is that's not our problem, that's their problem. Sadly, the people in the lower deck try to find solutions to their own problems. And unfortunately, some of those solutions end up being detrimental to society. When looking for water and they can't get those in the upper deck to pass it to them, what do they do? They simply drill a hole at the bottom of the ship. Then it becomes everybody's problem. And now they can't say it's their problem. It becomes our problem. Like I said, Ideology without grievances does not mobilize people, does not produce a movement. Ideology without grievances does not produce violent extremism. Grievances are what ignite the fire. It is when folks feel violated, when they feel oppressed, cheated, betrayed or hurt, that they go the violent way. Nelson Mandela said during his trial that it would be wrong and unrealistic for African leaders to continue preaching peace and nonviolence at a time when the government met our peaceful demands with force. It is only when all else had failed, when all channels of peaceful protest had been barred to us, that the decision was made to embark on violent forms of political struggle. Imagine a peace-loving person like Nelson Mandela saying this. Now, this is no justification for violence, do not get me wrong. However, there is a strong need for the government to consider realistic alternatives to violence in addressing human rights abuses and other real or perceived grievances. The famous Islamic scholar called Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayaw said, in our approaches to removing injustices, we should not create further injustices. So let us recognize that if we do not respect the rights of citizens, if basic needs are not meant and essential services, there will come a time where there will be another grievance, where another charismatic leader will come along, regardless of the faith they may belong to, who will sink this ship for innocent people. And that brings me to my third point, the need for peace building, peace studies, bridge building and interfaith dialogue. Opportunities where people get to share knowledge with key players and the different pieces of the puzzle required for peace are discussed. So what is critical is community leaders, Christian and Muslim leaders at the grassroots level have bridge building going on. Why? Because if the conflict is a tribal issue, they are the peace brokers. If it's a religious issue, they can intervene. And if it's an indigent settler problem, well, they at the local level are in the best position to diagnose it. And if those benefiting from the crisis, those stoking the flames of discord are those in the upper deck, well, the people in the lower deck appreciate the value of peaceful coexistence and will not take the bait. Usually it's we in the upper deck talking on their behalf, unfortunately misrepresenting and misdiagnosing them that prolong the suffering of the innocent. There are two maxims of inclusivity that I want to share with you. The first is nothing about us without us. So nothing about women without women, nothing about the youth without the youth, and in this case, nothing about conflict in local communities without equal representation from all parties of those communities concerned. Otherwise, we simply go with our pre-existing stereotypes and we end up wrongly judging and wrongly prescribing. No correct doctor would prescribe drugs to a patient they have not seen. Why? Because symptoms may sound similar, but some other visible signs may be missing until they see the patient. So the second maxim of inclusivity is think local, act local. 
Yes, I know we've all been taught to think global, act local. However, in this case, think local, act local. Why? Because some of these communities have never spoken to one another because it's a majority minority problem. It's tribal issues and sentiments and each side is doing their own thing until something goes wrong. If religious and community leaders are the most experienced, then we need to look at effective bridge building methods. Let's look closely at what a solid, well-built bridge requires. First, it needs a solid foundation from all sides. That means communities, both Muslims and Christians, if in the context of interreligious dialogue, have to be on board. The Christians need to sincerely agree that they want a bridge. The Muslims need to sincerely agree that they want a bridge. The bridge must be owned by both parties. Also, you cannot be building bridges from one side to another. They have to come and meet in the middle. Otherwise, it'll break. They have to both meet each other halfway. Otherwise, there'll be no trust and no cooperation. So the bridge is built at the speed of trust. The other thing needed to build a solid bridge are competent engineers. Some of the anger at the local level is too hot for them to handle themselves without sentiments. Too much damage has already been done by both sides, most likely. There needs to be outside mediators that come in to facilitate peace. This is where some of those in the upper deck can play a role in better mediation, in teaching better conflict management, in better conflict transformation, in better trauma victim management, and better conflict resolution skills. Something important that has to be made clear is that when it comes to promoting peaceful coexistence, religious leaders have their limits. Traditional rulers have a role. Politicians have their roles. Some government agencies have their roles. The judiciary has a role to play. There has to be rule of law and there has to be justice. Law enforcement agencies have a role to play. So it can't just be religious leaders alone building the bridge. They need support. All other stakeholders needed for peace need similar training and orientation. And then you can't have people building bridges in the daytime while they're dismantling them at night. People involved in interfaith dialogue have to be very, very careful with what they say elsewhere. You can't be preaching peace in one forum and preaching hate in the pulpits. Otherwise, that bridge will never get built. Why? Because there's no trust. So the need for protection of the bridge is extremely important. Yes, we have our hate speech people. We have those in our communities who do not want peace. In fact, they want violence. We need to use respected members of the community who will help calm them down and get them to appreciate the need for that bridge. Otherwise, you in your community will be building bridges while others in your community will be burning bridges. If you are not careful, they will look at you, the bridge builder, as a traitor. Why? Because they never bought into the need for that bridge in the first place. So you have to be able to convince them that there are realistic alternatives to dealing with grievances other than going the violent way. And then lastly on this point, there is a strong need for bridge building and peace education, especially for our young ones. The need to start teaching peaceful coexistence from a curriculum level in our education system. Why? Because we realize that when you look at other countries who are more economically stable than we are, who have more political stability, who have a higher standard of education than we do, that these factors did not protect their communities from prejudice or violence. It is not true that the elite and the educated are the most objective. We find amongst the well-to-do, the highly educated, that they are as bigoted as bigotry comes. And we have to ask what went wrong with their education system, that it seems not to have immunized them against such sentiments. So we need to ensure that there are peace studies incorporated into the curriculum from the primary level all the way up to the tertiary institutions and that proper TTC is done for those who are going to teach it. And that leads me to my fourth and final point. If every Christian would be more Jesus-like, may God be pleased with him, we wouldn't be having these problems. And if every Muslim would be more like Muhammad, may Allah be pleased with him, we would not be having these problems. And so the need to look at our religious instructions. How much peace from a religious perspective are we teaching our younger ones from home, in our neighborhoods, communities, and in school? As a mother and a wife in Africa, permit me to use a metaphor of cooking. If from a very young age I teach my son the art of cooking, I teach him what spices go with what, and one day I tell him years later that there's a new dish I want to teach him. So I tell him chop the onions, he does, fry them. And then I say add the pepper and the tomato, no problem. Add the ice cream, he says what? Ice cream? And then I was like oh no 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 never mind, add the curry, he does. Then I say add coffee, 
at this time he's going to question my cooking abilities and wonder if mama really knows how to cook. Now one thing my son knows for sure is that as nice as ice cream may be by itself and as delicious as a cup of coffee may be, it does not go with that dish. However, if from a young age I teach my son how to cook and this time around I tell him add the onions, add the tomatoes, add the coffee and he questions me the coffee and I say yes add it and you know as an African mom that's how I would speak and he adds it. Later on, I tell him, add a spoon of Fanta, and he does. The moment my son starts to accept things in an unquestioning way, later on when I tell him, add the sand, add the pebbles, he will do it without questioning me, sadly, because he's become a blind follower. So let me put it this way. If I keep teaching my son love, justice, forgiveness, love, justice, forgiveness, the moment somebody tries to say to him, cruelty, vengeance, hatred, killing, he knows very well that there is something wrong with that. Many of our young people these days are being taught to hate from a very young age. Instead of messages of peace from our faith, we confuse them with messages of violence, battles, messages of war. Now, I'm not saying remove these from the pages of history. Please don't get me wrong. But we need to keep them in context and emphasize the peaceful part of our religions. For example, many from the young generation do not know that all the battles fought during the time of the prophet were defensive battles. It is when our kids have been immunized with values and principles of peaceful coexistence, justice, that when a half-big scholar, preacher, teacher, politician, or group with extremist ideologies come along preaching hate, that they are able to detect that this is not my religion, however, neither is it theirs. And they are courageous enough to question or challenge them, but most importantly, they will not fall prey. What we need is intellectual vaccination and spiritual immunization so that the innocent can differentiate between humane and destructive interpretations of the religion. It is in good caring Christians and good caring Muslims that the scales may be tipped from the direction it's heading today, where Muslims who do not care and Christians who do not care, who agitate each other and drill a hole in our ship, and then we all suffer by just keeping quiet or doing nothing. There's a beautiful quote by Edmund Burke where he said, all that is required for the triumph of evil is for good men to remain silent. The suggestion is, can we, in addition to the compulsory subjects our children have to take in school, add peace building from a religious perspective into the curriculum as well? I am making this suggestion because I have seen this done successfully. Now, we have a faith-based school, New Horizons College in Mena, and we've run this school for 25 years. But our learners do not graduate without going through our TTC program in interfaith dialogue, comparative religion, conflict resolution, misconceptions about Islam, and immunizing them against atheism and radicalization. It is a TTC course because it is our hope that when they go out there, they not only go immunized, but they will change any narrative that goes contrary to the true teachings of the faith. So back to my point, can we start deliberately teaching peace building from a religious perspective in the curriculum as well as at home? Where for Muslims, the heroes we call prophets or messengers like Muhammad, Jesus, Joseph, Moses, Noah, may Allah be pleased with them all and their companions. In other words, those who witnessed firsthand how those messengers practice what God wanted us to do on this earth. Heroes we respect, we highlight their examples and messages of peaceful coexistence, equity, justice, love and tolerance. In the Quran, Allah says, we have created you male and female and have made you into races and tribes so that you may know one another, not so that you may hate one another or kill one another. It is from the education I was given and the teachings of my parents that I grew up knowing that hate speech and violence does not go with my religion. However, it does not go with Christianity either. We have many stories in Islamic heritage, as we have in Christian heritage, of legacies of peace building. Some of those shared with me from a very young age were those of the Prophet trusting the lives of Muslim refugees of persecution into the hands of an Abyssinian king in modern day Ethiopia. Now, I am not a scholar of Christianity, but from the little I was taught, there are many stories of peace, and I know Christians refer to Jesus as the Prince of Peace. We have many common statements in both the Quran and in the Bible than what many would want us to believe. One that my father told us throughout our lives was return evil with that which is good. And you will see that he between whom and you there was animosity shall become as you were devout friends. And this is from Surat al-Fusilat, chapter 41, verse 34. 
In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26, it says, In your anger do not sin and do not allow the sun to go down while you are still angry. And in Matthew chapter 18 verse 21 and 22, Peter came to Jesus and asked, How many times shall I forgive my brother when he has sinned against me? Is it seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 70 times seven times. For God's sakes, do the maths. The prophet taught us that God shows mercy to those who show mercy to others, and God forgives those who forgive others. It is similar to what the Christians have in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now, if I may point out, nowhere does it say in either scripture, except if it happens to be a Christian or except if it happens to be a Muslim. The prophet said, I swear he is not a believer. I swear he is not a believer. I swear he is not a believer. And he was asked, who is not a believer, O messenger of Allah? And he said, one whose neighbor does not feel safe from his evil. Imagine. When the disciples were asking Jesus, what was the greatest commandment? He said, love your Lord with all your might, with all your strength, with all your heart. Then love your neighbor as yourself. In both cases, there were no exceptions made if it happens to be a Muslim or a Christian neighbor. We have more areas in common than those divisive, vile, evil individuals and preachers want us to believe. My parents raised us preaching peaceful coexistence. They raised us to stand up for justice, even if it's against ourselves or our loved ones. I would never stand with any religion that condones oppression, kidnappings, raping of women, killing of the innocent, hatred, bigotry, or divisiveness. I swear in Allah's name that whoever is doing it in the name of Islam is not a Muslim. We live in a society where we need people to develop an atmosphere conducive for bridge building. And we have to give credit to all those organizations and groups inside and outside Nigeria that are trying to support us and help us build this atmosphere of peace. So to summarize, in my humble opinion, what I believe are possible solutions. My first point is the emphasis on the metaphor of potholes. Different problems require different solution and don't misdiagnose. And then the second point is the metaphor of the ship, that there needs to be fair and equitable distribution of resources and equal access to opportunities for all citizens. And remember, ideology without grievances does not create a movement. And the third point is the metaphor of the bridge. We need holistic bridge building to be going on and all that's required to build a solid bridge. Don't forget the maxim, nothing about us without us and think local, act local. And my fourth and final point is the cooking metaphor. We need intellectual vaccination and spiritual immunization, starting from our homes, our places of worship, and we need to incorporate it into our curriculum, into our school system. We have scriptures on the tips of our tongues. We carry the religion in our looks, like it's a uniform that you wear. Sadly, many do not translate the message and the teachings from our books and scriptures into actions. They are just words that sound good. The input does not produce the right output. The litmus test of true religiosity is compassion. Compassion requires courage, strength, trust in God. We are taught that to travel fast, go alone. To travel far, go with others. So to travel far with others, we need compassion. We need love. We need tolerance. We need understanding and we need justice. Justice is critical for long-term peace. The rule of law is critical for long-term peace. Also, we need to stop pointing fingers. We need to recognize that we are all victims and recognize our common enemy and our common destiny. There is no other Nigeria for us to go to. Muslims, you cannot flush Christians and non-indigents out of Nigeria. Christians, you cannot flush Muslims and non-indigents out of Nigeria. This is our home and we live here, we die here. Nobody actually wants us voluntarily. Go to any foreign country, go to the airports and see who welcomes you. Trump has already said he doesn't want us. We have to settle our differences internally. We have to settle it ourselves. There are so many angles to fix things the numerous potholes we have here in Nigeria. This is just my humble submission. With all the problems we have, everybody has a role to play. Because if you're not a part of the solution, you're part of the problem. While not everyone is guilty of creating this negative climate change, everybody is responsible. We cannot afford to say it's their problem. We pray that with love and strength and faith, as it says in our national anthem, that Nigerians will stay together, faiths will get together, and the forces of good will triumph over evil. And I pray 
that God continues to give us the courage to defend our unity and uphold our honor and glory. So help us God. <laughs>